What is the Gender Inequality Index? How is it determined, and is it reasonable? In this chapter of The Little Pink Book, we will see how feminism has NGOs and even the United Nations well entangled in its tentacles. The Gender Inequality Index, or GII, is an attempt to measure the level of gender inequality in a society. Various organizations have their own methods for determining the GII, but they're all fairly similar. In this chapter, we will look at two of the most widely quoted, starting with the World Economic Forum. This is a bit of a long chapter, so strap yourselves in. As usual, all sources can be found in the description. We can find the WEF's methods of calculations on their website. First off, they tell us that the GII measures outcomes rather than opportunities or treatment. So right off the bat, we have the problem that equal treatment does not imply equal outcome. But fine, to be fair, measuring opportunity is not so straightforward. Then, wanting to distinguish between gender equality and women's empowerment, they say, The third distinguishing feature of the Global Gender Gap Index is that it ranks countries according to their proximity to gender equality rather than to women's empowerment. Our aim is to focus on whether the gap between women and men in the chosen indicators has declined rather than whether women are winning the battle of the sexes. Hence, the index rewards countries that reach the point where outcomes for women equal those for men, but it neither rewards nor penalizes cases in which women are outperforming men in particular indicators in some countries. Thus, a country that has higher enrollment for girls rather than boys in secondary school will score equal to a country where boys and girls enrollment is the same. I see, so when men are doing better than women, we mark that down, but when it's women doing better than men, it's considered equal because we don't want to get into this silly battle the sex is nonsense, it's not a competition. Well then why are you bothering keeping score at all? Their example of education says it all, really. They know that in the West, men are far behind women in education, so we can't have that ruining the intended results. Even Wikipedia couldn't mask the WEF's true intentions and pointed out that not only does women being favored count as equality, but they start from the assumption that women are held back even before going out to measure whether they are. Advocacy research at its best. Let's just take a look at the full consequences of such methodology. Clearly, if in some category women have less than men, that's unequal. And if men and women have the same, that's equal. So far, so good. But if women have more than men, they call that equal. So say we look at a set of categories within a society, and in all of them, women are doing as well or better than men. Then the GII will mark that as perfect gender equality. But if there is just one category in which men barely outpace women, then that society is considered to be advantaging men, even though men are behind in all but one category. In fact, women could be given virtually all of the resources in every category except for the one, and their GII would say women are disadvantaged. So the index is set up to guarantee a result of women being disadvantaged. But they don't stop there. One of the things they look at is life expectancy. Here they know ahead of time that globally, women outlive men. So based on their methods, this would always show up as equal. Not good. So what they do is they say, because the world average has women outliving men by 6%, then that will be called par. So if men outlive women, that's clearly unequal. And if women outlive men, that's equal as per the original rule. But now, if women outlive men by less than 6%, they consider that unequal in men's favor, even though women still live longer. How does that make any sense? I will get to the justification for this later on. Now let's take a look at the United Nations Gender Inequality Index found in their Human Development Report. We can find their methods in the technical notes section. The good news is, they don't count women doing better as equality. But they have all sorts of other tricks up their sleeves to ensure the, shall we say, correct results. There are a number of papers out there harshly criticizing their methods, which can easily be found with a simple Google search. The most obvious problem being their unnecessarily convoluted mathematical model. While they may have started off better than the WEF, the UN too renormalizes the age expectancy to a 6% offset. 
which they justify by saying the difference is simply a result of biology. Seriously, UN? Are you so sure of yourself that biology is the only culprit? Sure, there are biological reasons why women generally live longer. I'm not denying that. But what about dangerous jobs that kill men and destroy their bodies and their health, which are almost never done by women anywhere in the world? After all, about 95% of work-related deaths are men. Is that biology? And what about wars? Dead soldiers are virtually all men, and there are a lot of those. In clan and tribal type societies, the fraction of men who die before the age of 30 just due to intertribal warfare ranges from 10 to 60 percent. The level of violence outside of civilization is mind-boggling. You don't think wars might just maybe play a role in a men's life expectancy? Or is that biology too? I love how when women seem to have an advantage, it's biology. But if you dare mention that biology might sometimes work in men's favor, you're burned at the stake for heresy as if you had suggested we lynch the Virgin Mary. Just ask Larry Summers from Harvard. But it gets worse. In their calculation of the GII, they include an index for girls for the fraction of maternal deaths due to childbirth. So men dying younger can be entirely written off to biology, but complications in childbirth are not? That's societal? Are you kidding me? Does the UN actually think that the difficulties of childbirth are due to patriarchal societies imposing them on women, instead of happening despite our best human efforts to save the dying women? But wars and exploding oil rigs are biological? And they don't stop there. They also include an index to measure the amount of teen mothers. But what about teen fathers? Adolescent boys can procreate too. Usually, a teen mother means a teen father as well. And teenagers reproducing isn't biological either? What do they think? Teenagers engage in procreative activities due to societal pressures and not biological impulses? Besides the logical issues here, it turns out these two measures dominate the GII. A number of papers have pointed out that if you hold everything that goes into the GII equal and set the teen birth rate to the lowest in the world, then it alone gives a relatively high score of 0.15, 0 being perfect equality and 1 perfect inequality. So the only way to do better than 0.15 is if in the rest of the parameters considered, men do significantly worse than women. And if you look at the 10 most equal countries, we see that their scores are well below 0.15. But because of these two female-only parameters, the GII incorrectly indicates that women are still doing worse. All of this is just the tip of the iceberg. Let's take a look at what the report actually says. It's almost 300 pages long, so I can only go over a few points, but I encourage you to read it and see for yourself the endless set of bending over backwards, goalpost moving, and mental gymnastics to portray women as victims at the hands and mercy of men. Not to mention the series of meaningless, geometrically appealing figures connecting random virtues and concepts. Can anyone explain to me what on earth these figures actually mean? Then they come up with brilliant solutions like this one. Encouraging the promotion of zero-tolerance laws to end violence. Oh, thanks, Mom, for ending world violence with a simple wag of the finger and a reminder that violence is bad, MK. Okay? Of course! What were these people in war-torn and infrastructuralist societies thinking? Just stop tolerating violence. Next time someone tries to kill you, just tell them you won't tolerate it, and peace and love will overcome. Problem solved. They also remind us of the causal relationship between poverty and violence among young people. You mean men, right? It's a very well-known and studied phenomena that extreme economic relative inequality leads to violence among young men competing for status. But only women and gender-neutral people ever suffer from tragedies and injustices. Here's a gem of impeccable reasoning accompanied with another meaningless graphic. Educating girls lowers the infant mortality rate. Really? Are you sure causality can be inferred from such a correlation? How about this? Better infrastructure generally leads to both better education and better medical care for everyone. After all, based on their own data, they could have just as easily concluded that educating boys lowers the infant mortality rate. And where have we seen this wheel before? It looks suspiciously similar to the feminist Duluth wheel of domestic violence. By similar, I mean identical. Clearly, feminism doesn't have its tentacles wrapped around the UN. And just in case you weren't sure yet who the West considers to be worthy of care and empathy, here the UN clarifies it for us. Only the mortality rates of women and children are of concern. They could have easily included men and just said people. 
What's wrong with that? Why is the UN going out of its way to exclude men? If that's not clear enough, on the same page they highlight the importance of recognizing the diverse identity of ex-combatants and child soldiers. Why would that be important? This sounds like a clever way of claiming these tragedies happen to everyone. But in reality, if the UN were to break it down by group, they would be forced to admit the obvious fact that virtually 100% of these people are of one demographic. As I said, only women and gender-neutral people are subject to death. And it continues, Women take on a disproportionate amount of unpaid work in the home, foregoing opportunities for other activities including education, visits to health centers, and work outside the home. There are more women than men living in poverty. In 2012 in Latin America and the Caribbean, there were 117 women in poor households for every 100 men. More feminists whining about unpaid housework. Why would someone pay you to take care of your own home? And why is working in the home necessarily worse than working outside the home? What is this arbitrary value? What if those women prefer to be at home? They say there are more women living in poverty in Latin America. What about the rest of the world? And by poverty, they mean poor households, not the homeless, who are overwhelmingly men. Isn't it worse to have no home than a poor home? Plus, this is misleading. One of the reasons there are more women in poor households is because there are more dead men in poor societies. As it has been globally for almost the entirety of human history. For most of history, most of the population was female because of the high death rate of men, with the exception of the wealthy. This is just another example of the feminist narrative, if and when men die, we must cry for women. Of course, the report is filled with the standard feminist propaganda on domestic violence as the root of male control over women and patriarchy. The broken record just keeps turning. But back to deaths that matter. Here we find out that not only is it natural for women to outlive men, but actually it's oppressive to women because due to the tragedy of their longer lives, they have to stretch their pensions over more years. The trick here is to have a vague theory. If your theory is sufficiently vague, you can always make it fit the data, as explained by Richard Feynman. If the process of computing the consequences is indefinite, then with a little skill, any experimental result can be made to look like a, an expected consequence. You're probably familiar with that in other fields. For example, A hates his mother. The reason is, of course, because she didn't caress him or love him enough uh, when he was a child. Actually, if you investigate, you find out that as a matter of fact, she he did love him very much and everything was all right. Well, then, it's because she was overindulgent when he was a child. <laughs> so by having a vague theory, it's possible to get either result. Oh, wait. Now, the cure for this one is the following. It would be possible to say, if it were possible to state ahead of time, how much love is not enough and how much love is overindulgent exactly, and then there would be a perfectly legitimate theory against which you can make tests. It is usually said when this is pointed out, how much love is and so on, oh, you're dealing with psychological matters and things can't be defined so precisely, Yes, but then you can't claim to know anything about it. <laughs> I hope you've enjoyed today's chapter in the Little Pink Book. If so, please be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.